Um, so let me pray. I uh, want to welcome you. If you're new, you have come at a strange time. We're talking about demons and beasts and 666 and all kinds of weird stuff. So don't be frightened off. This is a part of a series that we've been in for quite a long time, Book of Revelation. Um, you can always go online and pick up the past messages if you want to catch up. But uh, um, I hope it doesn't frighten you off. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for bringing us together today. God, as we open up your word, as we try to wrap our heads around what it is that you are saying to us, what it is you're inviting us to, what it is you're reminding us of, uh, God, just help us to be receptive, ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, like I said, we are going to have fun today. We're going to talk about a couple of beasts and the number 666. But I want to remind you, this is part of a pause in the book of Revelation. Last week, we talked about this woman who gave birth to the child. And, we, we, and I may not have made this real clear, but I want to make it clear now. That was Mary, but it was more than Mary. It, it was Eve, but more than Eve. It was Sarah, but more than Sarah. This woman represented all of the people of God, the people of Israel in the Old Testament and the church from the time of the resurrection of Jesus. And so this woman that represents all of God's people is at continual war against the dragon. And chapter 12 ends with the dragon very, very ticked off and angry standing on a beach. And then we pick it up here in chapter 13. But I want to remind you some keys to understanding the book of Revelation. None of this is new if you've been here. But I want to remind you that there are different ways to interpret the book of Revelation. Re Revelation is one of the most controversial books. Scholars, very, very smart people, a lot smarter than me and you, uh, disagree on these things. And so it is okay to disagree on some issues of eschatology. At the end of the day, Christ is coming again. We all believe in that. But just for, by way of reminder, I want to remind you that one of the ways to interpret Revelation is called the preterist, meaning everything is in the past. Everything that we're reading now already happened and has been fulfilled uh, right around 70 A.D. And then you have the historicist, and the historicist believes that revelation is always <laughs> unfolding from the first century to the second coming of Christ. From the time that Jesus rose from the dead to the time he comes again, history is kind of cyclical and it's repetitive, but it is all moving towards a climax. And then you have the recapitulationist. Say that five times fast. Recapitulationist. And the recapitulationist <laughs> believes that there are seven sections in the book of Revelation that span, also like the historist, they believe from the first coming to the second coming of Christ. And then, of course, you have the futurist. And this is the most popular view in the last 60, 70 years, especially in the West. Uh, and you have the futurist that might be premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, and so they disagree on the seven years of tribulation and when Christ will return in the beginning, in the middle, at the end. But everything in Revelation, almost everything in Revelation is something that they see as yet to come. But here's something to keep in mind. There's weaknesses and there's flaws with every single one of those views. And so hold on to your eschatology very, very loosely. I am reminded that Alistair Begg said that when reading Revelation responsible, we need to remember that the plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. The plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. And so we're going to always try to come back to, well, what is John really trying to tell us? What is he really trying to tell us through all this imagery and symbolism and numbers? And that's really important to remember because this letter was not written to us. It was written for us. But it was not written to us. It was written to specific people in Asia Minor. And we walked through the seven churches. And I believe personally that Revelation is not linear. It's more cyclical. It's not about what happens next. It's about what John sees next or what he hears next. And if you pay attention as you read, you'll see that a lot. John turned and saw. John turned and heard. And those are really, really important cues as to how to interpret what we are reading. Think about the numbers. We have 42 months, we have three and a half years, we have 666, we have 144,000. That all meant something to people in the first century. 
If I was to tell you today that there's going to be another 9-11 in San Francisco this week, what would come to mind? We just remembered 9-11 yesterday, 20 years ago. That means something to us in our culture, especially those of you that were there and saw it, not there in New York, but you were alive, you were old enough to remember, and how powerful of an impact that had on you. And yet we just use the numbers 9-11. It means something. These numbers meant something to those in the first century. And so, Revelation, one more encouragement. Revelation is God's living word. It may have been written 2,000 years ago, but it is always up to date. The Bible is alive and it speaks to us today. And it's about us living with hope in our future. And it's about certainty of our future. No matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's going on in the world, how chaotic things might be in our lives or in this world. And things scare us and we get afraid about what's going on. And Revelation was meant to speak to us today so that we could live with poise, with confidence, with assurance, and with hope, no matter what. So if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, Jesus used that phrase quite a bit, the result will be a deep abiding peace and joy that will pervade your life no matter what is going on. And so, chapter 13, we are introduced to two beasts. And so I'm going to read the first 10 verses to you, and I'm going to use the New Living Translation as I read. And we're going to talk about the first beast first. That makes sense. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns. And written on each head were the names that blasphemed God. The beast looked like a leopard, notice the language, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, remember the dragon from last week, chapter 12, the dragon gave the beast his own power and the throne and great authority. And I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worship the dragon for giving the beast such power. And they also worship the beast. Who, listen to the language, it might sound familiar. Who is the great, who is as great as the beast? Who is able to fight against him? And then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God. Notice he was allowed. And he was given authority. He didn't have authority. He was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. That word conquer is really important. In fact, we've seen that word over and over that you and I are more than conquerors. We are conquerors. And now suddenly the table has turned and this beast is the one who conquers. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. Again, all of that should sound familiar. We've heard it before. And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Verse 9. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. See, listening is not just about hearing. It's about understanding. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone who is destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. Underline this final sentence. Etch this in your heart and mind. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. Now, this beast, we learn right away, is given great Power. Most scholars agree that this power had to do with political and military power. What some of us miss as we read Revelation is that Revelation was a political subversant, uh, subver how do you say that word? Subversive. Subversive letter. It was meant to stand against the state, to stand against the 
Empire, the Roman Empire that was demanding worship. Every time we gather, even like this today, even though we live in a country that is free, where we are free to worship and gather, this is the most politically subversive thing that we do as Christians. When we sing, when we gather and worship, we are saying, it is not you over in Washington, D.C. that we are loyal to first. We are loyal to Christ first. But I want you to notice how similar the beast resembles the dragon from the last chapter. This beast is given power, is given authority. And because of its power and authority, it is worshipped. And its main motivation, if you saw it, it's mentioned three times, is to slander and blaspheme God and those who dwell in heaven. Now notice that the dragon and the first beast, what they mimic. If you if you're reading it, you go, man, that sounds familiar. What we're going to see here is that we have this unholy trinity. We have the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. But not only that, we have what looks like a death and resurrection. Not only that, we have a multitude of people from every tribe, people, and language, which is an echo from Revelation chapter 7 in the throne room of heaven where we have all of God's people, every tribe, language, and tongue worshiping God. Even the worship is mimicking worship of God. Over and over in Psalms and in Exodus even, we see this phrase, who is as great as the Lord? But it's changed. Who is as great as the beast? Who is able to fight against him? And this is so similar to what we see over and over in the Psalms, especially. And then we even see how this, how John kind of reworks in this image of the beast, uh, almost exactly what we see in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, we have uh, a vision that Daniel gets of this great statue. And it looked like a leopard and it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And later on in chapter 7, or later on in Revelation chapter 13, we'll even see that the second beast erects a huge statue that is to be worshipped. Now we have to take that into account because remember as we read Revelation, we are not reading anything new. We're seeing stuff that has been already written that these first century readers would have been very, very familiar with. Uh, in fact, um, one scholar said that there might be as many as 518 hyperlinks in Revelation directly related to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. But if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, you'll see that he has a vision of the future world powers. You know, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and finally the Romans. And they're all described as having military and political power. And one of the terms that is used to represent political and military power is horns. Horns. Now, it's really interesting if you read a lot about eschatology and you study the book of Revelation and you hear all the different views. For a long time, there was, and some still hold on to this, but the, the ten horns on this beast, you know what they represented? The European Union. I looked it up this morning on Wikipedia. Now, you can't always trust Wikipedia, I, I know, but last count, I think there's 27 countries representative in the European Union. So it's almost as if God is up there, okay, when there's 10, I'll come. Uh, nine, no, uh, 10, oh, 11, 12, you know, and, and God's confused or something about when to come. Uh, and, and, and so we've got to be careful how we interpret these things. Remember, first century readers, this meant something to them. They had the image of Daniel, but they also had images of Rome. It's interesting because Rome is known as the city built on seven hills. I wonder if the seven heads have something to do with Rome being built on those seven hills. Here's what I'm certain of. First century readers, as they read this story, as they heard it most likely, uh, the book of Revelation, their mind went to very specific things in their world, in their lives, in their culture. And so not only do we see these echoes from the Hebrew scriptures 
in Exodus, in Daniel, in Psalms, we also have to remember what is happening in the first century. These are guardrails. Hebrew scriptures, first century Roman culture. As much as we can understand those two things, it will help us in understanding what John is saying in the book of Revelation. What's interesting is, is that from the time of Julius Caesar, Roman emperors have been deified. They were given the status of gods and they were worshipped, but only after their deaths. Later on, some of the Roman emperors said, I don't want to wait till I die. Domitian especially demanded that he be addressed as Lord and God. So imagine living in a culture where the supreme leader in your country that has all the power and authority so that you can either submit to it, worship it, so that you can profit from it economically, or you're in trouble. And imagine getting together in a culture and worshiping with other Christians, reminding yourself that your allegiance is to God alone, how subversive that is in that culture. Everywhere you went in the Roman Empire, there were shrines, temples, and altars offered and sacrificed to the emperor, uh, to gods behind the emperors. For example, Zeus or Jupiter. In fact, there was a common saying, and I've shared this before, that was, went like this. Zeus was, Zeus is, Zeus will be, oh great Zeus. So if that is all part of your culture and part of the language that you hear on a regular basis, when you're reading John, he is stealing all those things and saying, those are false gods, those are a false trinity, and those are words that are only set aside for the one true God. After Nero's death, in AD 68, the rumor spread that he would return to life. In fact, when Domitian took power, uh, who was probably the emperor at the time of John's writing, was often called a second Nero. And there was a, a, a legend during the first century that Nero had been raised from the dead in the form of Domitian. And so when you think about this, what are the options that we have when we look at this first beast? If you're a futurist, this beast is identified as the Antichrist later on in Revelation, but he will one day raise to power. Some people think that he's already alive today, somewhere in the European Union. He's going to be given authority over all the earth. But until then, the Bible says and makes clear that we will have many Antichrists who come and do great damage in our world. But futurists believe that we are reading prophecy. <coughs> that is still yet to come. If you're a preterist, this has all happened in the past, and you're like, no, this was Nero, and it doesn't apply to anybody else. What we're reading is history, but if you're a recapitulationist, <laughs> go ahead, try to say it, make fun of me. <laughs> or you're a historicist, what you are reading is, this is the way of the world. This is the way of the world, it always has been, and it will always be. I do think Revelation is leading to a climax. I do think it's leading to a, 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 an experience in this life that will be harder and harder and harder to be loyal to Jesus. But I think what we're seeing is a beast that represents uh, political and military power that is playing, being played out over and over and over throughout history. And this is not hard to imagine even in the last hundred years or so for us in the West. Think of the Antichrist that have risen to power. Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, Mussolini. Even more recently, Taliban. How about North Korea's Kim Jong-un or the Supreme Leader of Iran? Or China's Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping. One of the things that they all had in common is that they have a strong resistance to the church. And so as I said, be careful. Be careful to hold, not to hold your view of eschatology too tightly. There's problems with all of them to some degree. But as we try to understand what John is saying to us, we need to keep the plain thing, the main thing, the main thing, the plain thing. I think what we're looking at is the challenge that every generation faces. Every generation faces the challenge. What does it mean? What does it look like to be loyal to Jesus and to his church? And what we see in this chapter is that you have two options. Either you are loyal to the beast or you're loyal to Christ. And by the way, it looks like the beast is winning. He's conquering. He's been given authority. He's been given the ability to 
conquer. And so it looks like the beast is winning often in history. And so we are either going to be loyal to him or we're going to be loyal to Christ. And we have to ask our que ourselves that question. Who am I going to be loyal to? Who am I going to serve? Who am I going to worship? But here's the thing. Sometimes being loyal to Christ, it costs. It costs. I'm wearing my pray for the persecuted church t-shirt. Every day I pray for someone. In fact, just two days ago, I prayed for a young Christian couple. The day Americans got out of Afghanistan, they gave birth to a little girl. And I thought, what kind of future is in store for them? Sometimes being loyal to Jesus costs you. It might mean prison. It might mean the sword. It might mean economic hardship. It might mean being mocked or judged or rejected. And so John says, this means God's holy people must endure. That is the invitation. That is the, the, in the, uh, the calling that we have, whatever's going on in this world, whatever's going on politically. We must endure. We must patiently endure. Now, lest we think that we're immune to persecution here in America, I think, and this is, this is Adam, this is conjecture, this is not in the Bible, but I think that we may now live in a time where being faithful to Jesus might look like we are not a good American. Someone said once, and, and I think they hit it spot on, if you're over 50, you tend to see America as Israel. If you're under 50, you tend to see is, uh, America as Babylon. What does it look like to be faithful in Babylon? Now, let me preface this. I love being an American. I've traveled to more countries than states. I've been in 16 different countries. I've lived in Africa. I have an American flag that hangs on my garage. In fact, living in Africa, I got really interested in America. I've come to appreciate America and what it stands for by living outside of it. America, for all of its faults and all of its difficult history, has done more to lift more people out of poverty, out of oppression, and has done more to advance religious freedom and the gospel than any other country in world history. And all you have to do is look at how much we help other countries. We are the first on the scene when there's a natural disaster. We are by far, I mean, it's not even close. You can take the next 10 countries, they don't even equal how generous we are as a country around the world. And yet, we live in a culture that has redefined morality in areas like euthanasia, abortion, gender, sexuality, and if you're over 60, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. <laughs> we're not in Kansas anymore. We are in Babylon. And if I can get you to make that one shift in your mind, that we as followers of Christ, we are a peculiar people, people Peter says. We are sojourners, Paul says. We are temporary residents on this planet. We are Christians first who happen to live in America. And I think you ought to be a good American. I think you ought to vote. I think you ought to be involved at whatever level you're able to politically. But never forget, where is your ultimate loyalty? Amen. And so we must be careful. We need to examine our hearts and our lives. Are we more loyal to a political party than we are to the kingdom of God? I got to see my grandson yesterday. It's been like three months since I was like having withdrawals. We celebrated his first birthday out in Modesto and I got to see my six foot nine, I won't say how much he weighs, brother-in-law, Dave Babb. And he's an elder at a church up in Twain Heart. And he was telling me a story about his church when they bought an elementary school and were converting it into a church. They haven't even yet, you know, put all the things in and, you know, everything still needs to be set up and moved. But right away, first Sunday, people began to complain about two things. Where's the cross and where's the flag? You know what they were way more upset about? The flag. 
we must examine ourselves and, and, and question ourselves. What is it that we are truly loyal to? Here, here's a clue. If you want to know what you're really loyal to, loyal to, what makes you mad? What gets you most upset? When you watch, well, I call it the news, it's really propaganda <laughs> for either side. But it is meant to get you mad. It is meant to get you to divide from your fellow Americans. It is meant to put a wedge in your life and it is meant to call you to loyalty to the state. And so how do we as Christians, as Americans too, never cross those and always put our loyalty first in the kingdom and so John says we must patiently endure we don't fall back we don't hide we don't continue uh, to live we, we try to live continually faithfully to Christ we pray for our neighbors we try to love our neighbors try to serve our neighbors no matter what they believe or what they believe about us and we also look for every opportunity to boldly share our faith to anyone who is listening and so that first beast, in a very real sense, represents the political and military power that is always kind of resurrecting throughout world history. Let's talk about the second beast. If the first beast is all about political power and authority, the second beast, it seems to be mostly about religious power, religious authority. And while we in the West enjoy religious freedoms and are protected under law even, to gather and worship, the second beast may be more dangerous to us than the overt persecution of the church. Listen to what he says, and I'm going to pick it up in chapter, uh, uh, verse 11, chapter 13. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. Remember, the first one came up out of the sea, which a lot of scholars think is, has to do, he comes up, he comes uh, from among mankind. The sea, in some cases in the Old Testament, represents mankind. This beast, though, comes up out of the earth. He had, listen to the language, two horns like those of a lamb. He's still mimicking. He's still mocking the lamb of God. He has the appearance of a lamb, but then it says, but he spoke with the voice of the dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. Notice he is a pastor, he is a worship leader. He is trying to direct people to worship the beast. He's also called the prophet later on in Revelation. We'll get that to that in chapter 17. But he required all the earth and his people to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And now look at, he did astounding miracles even making fire flash down from earth, from the sky, while everyone was watching. With all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first be beast, he deceived, and that is his key. He is a de uh, deceiver. He deceived all the people who belong to this world. And he ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded. He's reminded us again. He was fatally wounded, and they came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that everyone refusing to worship it must die. And he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. Here it comes. And no one could buy or sell anything without the mark. Which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. We need patient endurance when it comes to the first beast. When it comes to the second beast, we need wisdom. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. The number is 666. All right, here we go. What is the 666? Here's the real question. Have you already gotten it? Do you already have the mark of the beast? Is it the vaccine? Someone called me once. said, Pastor Adam, I'm really scared. Someone told me that I got the mark of the beast. And I said, will they give you a shot in the forehead? Did they give you a shot on the forearm? I think you're okay. But maybe the more pertinent question for us is, well, what if we accidentally take the mark of the beast? What if we don't know? Well, it depends on how you interpret the book of Revelation. 
I see this as primarily metaphorical. I see this as using analogy to make a point. This is a propagandist leader. He is a religious leader, a pastor, a mirac does miraculous powers ultimately to deceive people. But here's the thing about deception. You don't always recognize it. That's why it's deceiving, because you don't always know you're being deceived. And some of you have been deceived. You've been lied to. You've been tricked. You've been fooled. And you know what it's like to find out later, Err, never again. But I want you to see that this is not some monster that has come up out of the earth. This is not some demonic figure or, or this, this you know, guy in a red suit with horns and a pointy tail. This is not scary. It's not dark. It's not obviously evil or bad. And it is not so much about the state's power like the, with the first beast. It is more about peer pressure. In other words, he doesn't come to scare us, but to lull us into indifference. The second beast is not coming to frighten us or to scare us, but to lull us into indifference. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, talking about false prophets and about Antichrist. He says this, and about Satan, these people are false prophets. You know, Paul's so much more easy to understand. He just, black and white. Uh, they are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Even Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 24, many false prophets will rise and shall deceive many. And you only have to take a, a short look back in history. Remember Jim Jones? 900 people drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, in our own backyard here, Holy City, everybody, anybody ever visit Holy City? Anybody know the history of Holy City? Right off Highway 17? Fascinating story, Google it, and I'll give you a quick little bit though. Back in 1919, there was a cult leader named William E. Riker. He had about 30 followers and they bought the property over there now called Holy City. His ideology was called this, the perfect Christian divine way. The perfect Christian divine way. And he preached celibacy, temperance, white supremacy, and segregation from all races and sexes. And so guess what? This supreme leader, he was allowed to have girls, but no one else was allowed to. How about Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth, written back in the 70s? Do you know a lot of his stuff didn't come true? You know what they call that in the Bible? When you make a prediction and it doesn't come true? false prophets. <laughs> or like when I was in college, Edgar Wisenant wrote a booklet called 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 88. <laughs> and he revised it to 89 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 89. And then I think people were on to his scam. <laughs> See, there's no shortage of false prophets in the last 2,000 years. And while followers of Christ need patient endurance facing the political and military power, we need wisdom. We need wisdom when it comes to the deception of this second beast. Would you recognize a false prophet? Would you recognize false teaching? Let me give you a couple clues. Because you might see these guys on TV. Uh, you might pop into a church. They always point people to themselves instead of Christ. Or his word. They always have strange beliefs about gender and sexual beliefs. They tend to create an us versus them mentality. We are the only true followers. And when the rapture comes, we will be the only true. I remember flying into the Philippines and these, these churches would just stick out like sore thumbs from up in the air. <coughs> Uh, and, and they all look the same. Some were small and some were massive. In fact, you can go to San Jose and you can find churches built in the very same model. It's called Iglesia de Cristo. And they believe that you better be in the church when the church is raptured, raptured because he's taking the whole building. <laughs> That's right. They're kind of built like a spaceship. Their beliefs are always attractive at first. Their beliefs are always, they, they always seem right and true and good at first. Lots of good stuff. 
False teachers are masters at taking the truth and twisting it just a little bit. Just like Satan with Eve. Did God really say? But ultimately, they have a path that leads away from Jesus. And then finally, I'll give you one other thing. They're very controlling. They tend to be dictators. They want control. They want power, especially over your wallet and your money. You know, I just, this is not in my notes, but I just want to say how encouraged I am by all of you who give. If you're suspicious about giving to a church, give somewhere else. Uh, it is so important to be generous and to give. Uh, you don't have to give here. But those of you that do, thank you. And I, I, I tell you, the board and myself, we are committed to being good stewards. And don't ever come and give me your offering, by the way. I don't want you, I just, I'll, I'll direct you to someone else. And so I, I never want there to be any hint of impropriety when it comes to me as the pastor when it, and handling money. And so please, uh, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. But this idea of money uh, leads us to this mark of the beast, 666, because John made it clear that if you had the mark of the beast, it affected your ability to participate in the economic system, to buy and to sell. So, is it the COVID vaccine? Is it the barcode? Is it a literal 666 tattooed on your head like Charles Manson? Obviously, there are many who take this literally, no doubt, but we have to consider what this meant to the first century readers. For example, listen to this. In Greek and in Latin and in Hebrew, letters of the alphabet also serve as numbers. And it is a well-known technique to add up the letters that comprise a proper name and use the sum to identify that person as code. In fact, they found some graffiti on a, on a latrine in Pompeii that dates back a long, long time. Weird place to put graffiti in a bathroom. But it said this, I love her whose number is 545. <laughs> so with that in mind, if you take that lane and that form of interpretation, the most probable candidate in the first century was Emperor Nero, whose name spelled out came to 666. But we also have this Old Testament imagery that is that jumps off the page as you're talking about something being written on your forehead and something written on your forehead. It goes all the way up back to Moses when he gave the law the second time in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, wear this on your forehead, wear this on your forearm. God's word, God's law must always be forefront in your mind. Because life is full of distractions. I don't think he meant literally to put it on your forehead and put it on your hand. He talked about putting it on the doorposts. In other words, make it prevalent so that you never forget. Amen. And I think John is drawing on Deuteronomy chapter 6 in this imagery of something that is imprinted on your forehead and on your hand. In fact, in just a couple verses... In chapter 14, we're going to learn and be reminded that the true followers of Jesus have been marked on their forehead. You have the mark of Christ on your forehead. Have you ever seen it? If you've given your life to Christ, if you've surrendered your life to Him, if you've accepted His substitutionary atonement, His sacrifice on the cross for your sins, you have been marked by God. And that is a permanent mark. He uses permanent ink and you cannot be erased. But we don't take that literally. Why do we take this one literally? Jesus made it clear. You cannot serve both God and money. In the first century, they paid a price for being loyal to Christ. It cost them economically. Because in order to have a job, to be part of one of the unions of those days, you would have had to offer sacrifices, eat meat sacrificed to animals. We talked about all this a long time ago in Revelation. But you were excluded from the economic prosperity system of Roman Empire if you did not bow your knee to the emperor. You took the number of the beast. If you compromised. If you put money and economic security before your loyalty to Christ, you took the mark of the beast. By the way, we see this happening today in China, 
in Iran, in Vietnam, in parts of India, in Indonesia, and many, many other countries. If you are a Christian, you are often excluded. You lose your job. You pay a high price uh, economically. And so in my view, and, and it's okay to disagree, and a lot of people do, to take the mark of the beast is to deny Christ, to place your loyalty to the current world power, whatever it is, wherever it is, and it is to worship the beast that allows you to profit and benefit economically. Like I said, I could be wrong. But it's not something I worry about. I don't fear accidentally taking the mark of the beast and then being rejected by God. God is too good. God knows those who are His. Our names are written in the book of life and it cannot be erased. And so I don't worry about it. It's not something I'm afraid of. It's not something I ever even think of. And the way we learn to discern a false prophet or false teaching is not by trying to learn all the false teaching that is out there. We do exactly what bankers do. We study the real thing. We study the real thing. In order for account, someone who studies this uh, and, and works in this industry to spot a counterfeit, you study the authentic one, the real one. A few years ago, I got a counterfeit $20 bill, someone put it in that jar at church when they got their coffee. Not at this church, it was several years ago before I came here, but I've always held on to that because it's so obviously fake, and the reason I know it's so obviously fake, because I know the real one pretty well. Let me close with this. Some of you are familiar with George Orwell, who wrote a novel called 1984 back in 1949. People today are saying, how did he know? In his book, 1984, he has a vision of a totalitarian state that is always watching its citizens, enforcing its rule through power, just like the first beast. And I've said this before, but think of modern day China. Modern day China now has one camera for every four people. There's over a billion people in China and they have one camera and they are even putting cameras inside every church, every state church in China. They're watching. But in 1931, Aldous Huxley, uh, who had portrayed uh, a different dystopian future in his novel, Brave New World. And in this book, he imagines a future where the citizens are controlled by gratuitous sex, drugs, and meaningless entertainment. <laughs> Smartphones were not even a thought. Facebook was not even uh, conceived. Uh, one writer named Neil Postman, he says this, In Huxley's vision, no big brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book. For there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared that those who would give us so much information that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared that we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared that we would become a trivial culture. You can judge for yourself whose vision has proved to be accurate in our current culture. As we take communion, um, and I, I just want to say this, I may have ruffled a few feathers today. I, I hope at the end of the day, I pointed you to Christ. I hope that I reminded you that we live in a world that is not for us, but is against us. It may not be overtly against us, but it's very happy for us to be lulled into indifference and passivity. And so, 
I don't know where you're at personally right now. If you're dealing more with the first beast and you're feeling oppression and you're feeling persecution and, and, and the invitation to you is to patiently endure. And so as you take communion, look at the crosses and remind yourself that Jesus patiently endured for you. And that he will never leave you nor forsake you as you patiently endure for him. But I suspect the bulk of us need wisdom. Wisdom to know the difference between the truth and the lies of the second beast. Remember that Christ, what he did to save your soul, double down on your intention to remain loyal to him. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. He'll distract you. And so double down on your loyalty to him and don't be seduced into the worship of the beast or the dragon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And God, my hope is that, uh, that whatever I said today, whatever people heard today, that they would see you on the throne. <laughs> that they would be reminded that no matter how hard things get today, at the end, you win. And because we are yours, that means we win too. So help us to be faithful, even as the world changes. Help us to be faithful and to patiently endure even as we face challenges and obstacles and as we live in a world that is frightening and chaotic. And God, as we take this little cup of juice and this little wafer that represent your body and blood. God, we're reminded that you won the battle on that day. It was finished. You proclaimed that as you hung on the cross. It is finished. And so we don't need to work. We don't need to try to earn your love, your favor. We have it just by surrendering ourselves to you. And we do that now, even as we take these elements, we're reminded that this is an act of subversion to our state and to our country, but it is also a reminder of our loyalty to you and that you are the one true God and you are the one who is alone worthy of all of our worship and adoration and our praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.